Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everybody, for joining. So this is a, a great opportunity for us to uh, ask and our working group activities. We're trying to uh, solicit information as far as what the uh, what our working group members should be taking back to the international community so we can best serve the U.S. Arctic research community in, in both both directions as uh, providing that information to the, to the community and also taking our priorities, taking U.S. priorities back to the international community. So I ask, we really are, uh, our mission is really to uh, facilitate cooperation and collaborations in all aspects of Arctic research through, throughout uh, the groups, not just uh, working in the Arctic, but <laughs> political, um, um, business groups, uh, scientific organizations that are trying to promote and facilitate that, uh, those partnerships. So I ask, I'm just gonna give a real quick breakdown on, or summary on what I ask is, so we have uh, 23 member nations that are involved in, in Arctic research. Uh, we meet uh, uh, once a year at the Arctic Science Summit Week. Our primary activity is to, uh, to facilitate that Arctic Science Summit Week, which is held somewhere uh, in, in one of our member countries, um, somewhere in the world, uh, somewhere in the world, that's usually a good place to do it. <laughs> uh, so we have uh, our basic structure is that we have uh, a, a executive. Uh, we have a, a council of the 23 member nations. We have an executive committee that uh, tries to keep things running throughout the year. We have five working groups: so terrestrial, marine, cryosphere, atmosphere, and social and human. And our five working groups are going to report today on the activities that have been occurring over the last year and some of the plans to go forward. We also have three action groups, which are usually uh, short-term efforts to uh, to try and get new new programs going. So one of them is community communicating Arctic science to policymakers. Another one on our Arctic science business industry cooperations. And then we have a new uh, a scoping group on indigenous involvement in, in Arctic science. And uh, so our uh, the working groups really are the, the lifeblood and the, and the primary force in IOSC. So this is where all the action takes place. Um, they've been uh, really important in, in not just the uh, IOSC activities, but in facilitating and developing new programs which blossom into international collaborations. And I think you're going to hear some great, great uh, science that's going on today. And I think that uh, we want to try and, and encourage the U.S. participation in these various, these various uh, scientific activities. So one of the things I'm going to tell you about a little bit about is SEON. So I'm going to talk about just for a few minutes about that. And that SEON is one of the activities that uh, is endorsed and sponsored and promoted by the Arctic Council. And it's uh, also um, a, uh, an IOSC activity. And that uh, IOSC was, appoints the, uh, the vice chair, of which I'm the vice chair to SEON. And SEON is really, I think, really exploding in the recent years as far as the importance of the Arctic Observing Network has become greater and greater to understanding the changes that are occurring in the Arctic and trying to, it's such an expensive and such a, a huge effort that we have to have these international partnerships, international collaborations to develop the, the networks that we need and create the, the mechanisms to obtain and share and create open access for that data. So one of this is a statement that came from the 2016 Arctic Science Ministerial. It was held here in Washington, D.C. And it defined that, uh, pointed out the critical role for sustaining Arctic Observing Networks Initiative. And the uh, next Arctic Science Ministerial is going to be held in Berlin in 2018. And SEON is playing an important role in that meeting. The European Commission has really picked up on SEON and, and helping us to move things forward. Um, I think the U.S. has really been the primary impetus for creating the, uh, the Arctic Observing Network and SEON, the Sustaining Arctic Observing Networks Initiative. And, and through the partnerships with the Europeans, the Asians, um, we have some strong networks that are being established and I think we're, uh, we're really working, for it, working hard to try and maintain those networks into the future. So we have three goals now with the, uh, we're developing a new uh, strategic plan for SEON. And for the next five years, these are going to be our goals. One is uh, strengthening the Arctic observing observational capacity. And second is to uh, maintain free and ethically open access to all ob Arctic observational data, which is not an easy task. 
but we're something we really put a lot of effort into it. We've got uh, a great committee working on that. The third one is articulating justification for long-term commitment to Antarctic observing. And I think that's where SEAN can really play an important role in that we're working with the nations, the uh, member nations of IASC and of SEAN to make investments into Arctic observing and then to create those observation networks and then to open up their data for, uh, for free access to all. And so, Matt, I think I'll pass it on to you. Hello, uh, this is uh, Matthew Druckmiller. I'm serving as the, the second U.S. delegate to IASC, assisting Larry. Um, he provided a nice intro and overview of IASC and say on, I'm now going to just take a few minutes to, to, to bring to people's attention some, some upcoming deadlines. So, uh, the Polar 2018 meeting is being held in Davos, Switzerland um, through uh, June 15th through the 26th. Uh, this is a meeting that's being uh, jointly planned by IASC and the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, SCAR. And the goal is to bring together scientists from both poles and also the high latitude regions. The, the program currently has 12 categories and the deadlines for submitting abstracts previously was today, but um, a few days ago they extended that to November 12th. So you still have almost two weeks to, to prepare your, your abstract to this meeting. Um, the first part of Polar 2018 will be the SCAR and IASC uh, business meetings and, and satellite meetings. Next will be the SCAR and IASC Open Science Conference, and then th that will be followed by the SCAR delegates meeting in the 2018 Arctic Observing Summit. Uh, there's still also time to request side meetings. That can be done through the end of December or until uh, the space fills up. One of the things that will be happening at Polar 2018 is awarding the IASC medal. And so this is a medal that is awarded in recognition of exceptional and sustained contributions to understanding the Arctic. Um, most recent medal recipients include Terry Callahan, uh, John Walsh, and, and, and Jackie Gribmeyer. And these, uh, the process of nominating typically involves getting letters of support from collaborators across the globe. Um, and I think past successful awardees have, have um, been supported by by several letters of, of recommendation. So it, it is a, a, a process that, that um, needs some attention, but th there's, there's time. The deadline for that is, is December 31st. And next, I wanted to expand briefly on the IAS action groups, which, which Larry mentioned. Um, these are action groups that are established by the IAS Council to provide strategic advice on, on both long-term and urgent activities. And so there were three uh, that were approved in 2017. Uh, the first, communicate Arctic science to policymakers. I'll call out in this box a little bit more detail for this action group. It is focused on putting together recommendations for IAF on how to uh, develop um, a more productive uh, two-way communication with, with policymakers. And this is being chaired by Gozia uh, Smazek. I hope I said her name properly. She is a, a former IAS fellow, and this, this action group has, has broad representation across the nations involved in IAS. Um, they will be having a side meeting at Polar 2018 in Davos to uh, present the, the draft results of a meeting that they recently held at the Arctic Circle meeting in Iceland and throughout regular teleconferences in the year. Similar process was, is being done by the Arctic Science and Business slash Industry Cooperative Project. And the goal there is to facilitate discussions on how Arctic science can bring business, uh, can facilitate business and how business can in turn facilitate science, whether that be in terms of financing, sharing data, or other forms of collaboration. Um, and lastly, the, the scoping group on indigenous involvement is really focused on ways in which we can bring indigenous peoples in as partners in IASC and to, to bring traditional knowledge to bear on the science that's done. Lastly, I wanted to, to highlight an opportunity that exists in, in partnership between IASC and APEX, the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists. The IASC fellowships are intended to uh, engage early career scientists. Typically, I think it's defined as, as those that are within five years of, of earning their, their PhD. 
Uh, and the, these fellows have the opportunity uh, to participate in one to two years within a working group. So there is a, a fellow assigned to each working group. And um, then they also, after the conclusion of their fellowship, have the ability to stay connected to IAS for, for some additional years. Uh, currently, there are, are three IAS fellows, Manisha Ganeshan with the Atmospheric Working Group, Thomas Armitage with the Marine Working Group, and Alec Petty with the Chrysler Working Group, I, although I think Alec is, is more of a, an alumni fellow. Um, I think he's concluded his, his primary fellowship. So the deadline uh, for these applications is Monday, November 20. So I encourage people to, to share this with early career scientists that would be interested in working um, both in a technical way with the working groups, but also in a, in a, a position of communication across IASC and, and building their international network. So I'm going to pass this on now to um, Michelle Mack, who is a U.S. delegate to the uh, ter terrestrial working group. Right. Thank you. Okay, so I was elected to the terrestrial working group a little less than a year ago, and participated in one meeting of IAS. Um, here I'm showing you the steering group. This gives you a flavor for the types of topics that this group deals with. Our chair is Phil Wookie. He's an ecosystem ecologist, like me. The vice chair from the U.S. is Vladimir Romanovsky, a permafrost geophysicist. Um, Joseph Elster from the Czech Republic. He is a microbial um, environmental biologist. And then finally, Inga Fala Johnsader from Iceland. She works on plant herbivore interactions in tundra ecosystems. So this brings me to what the scientific foci are for this group. Um, well, like the leadership, this group exists at the intersection between the ecosphere, the geosphere, and the cryosphere. And in the context of IARPIC, we cover topics that are similar to both the terrestrial working group in IARPIC and also the permafrost working group. Um, in this group, we're very interested in the interface between terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems, in understanding both biological and geological diversity in the past, as well as then forecasting changes for the future. We're very interested in ecological connectivity and cross-scale phenomena in terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. And there are people in the group that are very interested in species interactions, trophic dynamics, including pests and pathogens. Historically, this group has focused on um, the area north of latitudinal tree line, but in our most recent meeting, we discussed expanding our purview to include um, wild Cuyahoga forest, forested areas that um, have either are in the Arctic or have large influences on the Arctic system. So that, I think, is an expansion of the domain of the terrestrial working group that really nicely um, fits with the focus of IARPIC. We have a number of cross-cutting foci, certainly biosphere feedback, climate change is one of the topics that gets mentioned the most. We're interested in social ecological systems and then ecological impacts of the changing cryosphere. All right, so in, in the most recent um, calendar year, there have been new terrestrial working group activities that have come online. And I think one of the most exciting ones is what we're calling the terrestrial mosaic. And so this is using the um, mosaic marine study that you'll probably hear about next, or several people down, um, as a, a metaphor for what we could do in the terrestrial environment. So what we would like to do is coordinate a um, major international effort to bring together observations of vegetation, of carbon, and of permafrost. And doing this in the context both of a Antarctic perspective that could offer insights into the mosaic project, but also you know, because of differences in time scale, um, a project in and of itself that would coordinate these three areas throughout the Arctic. A, a second new activity is focusing on Arctic wildlife, connecting ecology, health, and disease issues in a changing world. And um, there's another new initiative that focuses on the smallest of wildlife, the arthropods of the tundra. 
And then finally, one of the new initiatives has been um, supporting a group that has been making what they call frozen ground cartoons, a series of innovative outreach efforts to explain permafrost and mosquitoes and other things about the Arctic to people who aren't necessarily in the Arctic. Okay, so just to highlight some of these upcoming activities, um, there's going to be the first workshop focusing on the terrestrial mosaics. It will be at the Arctic Change Meeting in Quebec City in Canada during a week where most of us will be at AGU. So um, we will move forward and have another workshop at Polar 2018 that will focus on terrestrial mosaics. But I will try to keep everyone updated through the Arctic website on what emerges from that first workshop and then where we're going. The other thing I wanted to bring to your attention is um, Interact, Transnational Access, which is something that the Terrestrial Working Group has been very involved in for actually for several iterations of the Interact grant. And this is a program funded by the EU that um, funds either physical or remote access to field stations throughout the Arctic. And in this current iteration of the grant, up to 20% of the grant funding can go to people who are outside of the European Union, so it can go to the US. So they just finished their physical access call, but they now have open a remote access call. And, and this is, I think, very innovative in that you can apply to have someone at a, a field station somewhere in the Arctic collect data for you. So you don't even have to go and expose yourself to mosquitoes and inclement weather. <laughs> um, so January 31st, submission deadline for this. And I really encourage you to look at this program because I think it's um, a, a very powerful way that we can begin to coordinate some of our terrestrial observations and experiments. Okay, so the last thing I want to highlight is the Arctic Science Summit Week that is going to be coming up in 2019 and 2020. And thinking about um, sort of cross IARPIC themes that we might be able to propose for sessions where we can get international involvement and really focus on some of these um, performance elements that we've been discussing for both IARPIC and how it uh, carries over to IAP. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> oh, got to get out of there. Okay. Oh, this is a beautiful thing. All right, uh, my name is Andrew Petrov, and I am a vice chair of the Social and Human Sciences Working Group. So uh, this is another very diverse interdisciplinary group. Of course, we have everybody from health and sciences all the way to anthropology, geography, sociology, political science. Um, as Michelle just did, I could just mention our chair, Peter Scholz, who is historian, and uh, Gonkild is our vice chair. Is political scientist and myself as a human geographer alongside with Gail Fonda, who was a past chair, she's also, so we have predominance of geographers, I guess. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we only focus on that, right? I mean, our scientific posts I, I listed here, it's um, five uh, kind of internal ones and four cross-cutting. So internal ones include Arctic residence and change, looking at various dimensions of change social and climate change and how the residents, of course, are being impacted. Histories, perceptions, and representations of the Arctic. Security, governance, and law. Uh, natural resources and their use, exploitation, and development. And, of course, human health and well-being. So as you can see, some of these areas are quite narrow and some of them quite broad. So that's, of course, a result of uh, sort of um, working within the group what uh, we would like to emphasize in a given uh, couple of years that we pursuing them. Very important are cross-cutting, um, and uh, cross-cutting areas are sort of uh, something that IAT is encouraged and encouraging and uh, supporting. Uh, so that involves multiple working groups. So in our case, with social and human sciences, we have human health and well-being and ecosystem change. Looking at long-term impacts and vulnerability and resilience in socio-ecological systems. Um, competing forms of resource use and changing environment and perceptions, representations of Arctic science, including science communication. So um, our activities uh, sort of uh, within each given year sort of address 
or tag some of those focal areas. So if we look quickly at the um, activity that we had in the 2016-2017 reporting year, you can see that uh, we had a variety of things. Uh, some things are focused on uh, resilience and uh, sustainability. I think that's been an, an important element of what we did. Um, other activities, uh, for example, permafrost dynamic and ranger herding in Northwest Russia was very much interdisciplinary, trying to build relationship between physical scientists, permafrost science groups, and the social scientists, specifically when looking at ranger herding, for example, right? Um, so uh, we also had an interesting event uh, co-sponsored by a working group uh, in Spain, uh, looking at the European Arctic policy, so not particularly Arctic place, but I mean, that's uh, an important, important place to discuss Arctic issues as well. Another highlight that I would like to make is uh, our focus on long-term perspectives on Arctic socio-ecological systems. In fact, our working group has decided to dedicate three years to this theme. So starting from 2017, we had the uh, long-term perspectives on socio-ecological systems in the past. This year, 18, we'll have on, in the contemporary, and the, the 2019, there will be activities associated with the future scenario building for long-term ecosystem and social, uh, uh, socio-ecological system change. And the premise for that was actually our discussion in the working group that we sometimes focus on kind of short-term things and short-term changes, but we need to understand how what we find, for example, in archeological record actually translates into what we find now and what would be in the future. So kind of interesting connectivities, I think, uh, that's being highlighted. Important contribution of the working group was in ICARP-3, International Conference of Arctic Research Planning. Uh, we actually produced uh, a white paper that was directly feeding to and has directly fed the um, final document. I think it is like, I always like to quote one later, but anyway. Um, and our report is now actually available now as a book and Arctic Sustainability Research Past, Present and Future. So. If you're interested, please go ahead and buy it. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so, um, so these are our plans, just a few of them. Uh, so first of all, as I already mentioned, long-term perspective of Arctic sociological systems two and three upcoming. Uh, then we have a permafrost dynamic and radio herding uh, workshop that expands to uh, include Northeast Russia. Then our working group participates in a wonderful um, uh, initiative called RATIC, Rapid Anybody remembers what it is? Uh, rapid change and uh, infrastructure, and specifically in the uh, uh, Sustainable Arctic Infrastructure Forum, which was first held at, uh, in Prague at ISW. And that includes a focus on infrastructure, which actually also is one of the ICARP 3 priorities to understand the uh, evolution of uh, our Arctic infrastructure, both from a uh, biogeophysical perspective, also from social perspective, right? I, we always emphasize that infrastructure is a social construct, right? And it has to be understood from the beginning as a social construct to its kind of end, alongside with biogeophysical analysis. So that's the, the focus of our working group within that, within that process. And also involving engineers would be a priority for next year. And then a couple of other things that we initiated this year is uh, a workshop on global Arctic and basically looking at the connectivity between Arctic and non-Arctic areas, and that's been um, sometimes a, a theme that we sort of de uh, underemphasized, you know, focusing on the Arctic itself, the co connectivity between Arctic and the rest of the world uh, are important, so that's what's gonna be happening, and some funds are allocated towards that workshop. Gender in the Arctic, we have a big push to uh, uh, create a working group on gender under the International Arctic Social Science Association, and IAS, uh, is also contributing to that. And the collaboration with SCAR Humanity Social Sciences actually was very important for us, especially in light of the Davos Summit, which actually brings both Antarctic and Arctic social scientists together, which is very, very important connectivity, which we uh, are expanding because right now it's fairly limited. So that would be probably the end of my contribution. Okay, great. Hi, I'm uh, Lee Cooper. Um, I'm, uh, I work for the Chesapeake Biological Lab, University of Maryland Center for Environmental Sciences, and uh, my partner as a Marine Working Group uh, representative for the U.S. is Karen Fry, Clark University. Uh, and as Matt already mentioned, uh, we, we have a, uh, uh, an IASC fellow, Tom Armitage, who's also helping us out this year and uh, 
um, getting engaged in, uh, in some of the work that we do. Um, we have an international steering group, so the, the chair, I, I got elected to be the chair. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Ajimi Yamaguchi uh, from Japan and Heidi Marie Kassens uh, from Germany. So we've got a, a, a three continent uh, steering group um, and there's a little bit of politics that was involved in that. Um, uh, there, we, we have uh, some very high level science foci that you can see here that are listed on this slide. Um, the important things are that there's a, there's a paleo climate uh, element to, uh, to the interests of the working group. Uh, there's also interest in the marine uh, ecosystem uh, function as well as the physical oceanography and sea ice and the sea ice. Uh, we share, of course, some uh, joint interest, interest with the cryosphere working group that we'll hear from shortly. Um, and um, uh, anyway, we these these um, science foci have been out there for several years, and we I guess feel comfortable enough with them when we've met that we haven't fiddled with them too much. Uh, so they, 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 those are the high level interests of, of the Marine Working Group. Um, these are the activities that we've funded. Um, they include activities in the United States. So there, there are things of interest to, uh, uh, to US scientists. For example, uh, we funded uh, early career participation in a, a Gordon Research Conference in Ventura. Uh, we're also uh, supporting this year um, uh, the, uh, the uh, art which is the Arctic and Rapid Transition Early Career Group, uh, that they've gone through a, a cycle of, of uh, reorganization. Uh, they're gonna be meeting uh, very shortly in Paris. Uh, we're supporting uh, the fourth uh, DBO uh, network uh, workshop, which is now being expanded to the Atlantic. And we're providing early career support for scientists to attend the Polar 2018 uh, meeting that others have, uh, have mentioned. Um, also, an important part of uh, the priorities for IASC is uh, supporting, excuse me, supporting what we call uh, cross-cutting projects. Uh, that is, things that go across working groups. And so, uh, there's some set aside, some funds that are that are uh, set aside by the Executive Council of IASC uh, to support activities across working groups. Uh, and so, this year, when we had uh, choices to make endorsements of things that we thought were important to support. Uh, one of them that we did was uh, involve uh, productivity, biodiversity, and ecosystem uh, shifts at cryosphere ocean boundaries. So this is a special session. We're still accepting abstracts for if you, uh, you have now till the 12th uh, to send one in for, for a special session that arose out of our discussions. We're also supporting a workshop on uh, Arctic glaciology uh, that'll be that that is the the interface between glaciers and fjord systems in the Arctic. This will be held in Austria in January. Um, we uh, we were tasked by the executive committee of IASC to prepare a um, a work plan development uh, over uh, that would align with the uh, IASC uh, uh, strategic plan, and we we worked on that as a group electronically over May through September, uh, and and finally. Uh, uh, both uh, Heidi, uh, Marie, and myself are going to go to Russia uh, to participate in an in international science initiative, that, or what we call the ICER group, uh, uh, and that'll be uh, very shortly in Russia next week, uh, to discuss impediments and how we can uh, better um, uh, implement the uh, international uh, agreement signed uh, through the Arctic Council um, and, and implement a more transparent uh, uh, international research participation and bring the Russians, uh, the Russian scientists, uh, more uh, integrate more what they do into uh, into uh, uh, the internationally uh, cooperative and collaborative research and and, and get their input too. Um, let's see if I, oh, okay, we got got now we're going to go on to the crafts here. Oh, thanks very much. Sure. Yes, yeah, so I'm Alec Petty. Uh, I'm a scientist at NASA Goddard. Um, I think as has already been said, I, I kind of was an early career fellow. I'm kind of at the end of my fellowship now. Um, but our way of kind of making sure the fellows stayed a part of um, IASC and, and their work groups, we kind of appointed this position where, where they become a member of the steering group at the end of their fellowship. So that's kind of my position now. Um, and also a, as a US delegate um, of IASC, um, sorry, of IARPIC. Um, and so the other US delegates, I should mention are Elizabeth Hunky and uh, Bob Dolly as well. I believe on the right. Um, the chair of our working group is Francisco Navarro. Um, we have two vice chairs, Yari Harpler and Martin Schneebeli. 
Martin Sharp, the previous um, chair. So it's kind of interesting, you know, the, the different working groups kind of have slightly different ways, it seems, of um, approaching this idea of a of kind of scientific focus. Um, we had a kind of broad um, list of, of themes and foci um, and some cross-cutting um, foci, but we, we decided at the last IASC meeting to kind of condense these down into, into kind of three different themes um, that I'm going to talk about now. Um, themes that have been kind of aligned with some of the activities that our work group has been funding and also themes that we were kind of keen to, to start committing to. Um, so the first one is this this one that's been been going for a while in our working group: atmosphere glacier ocean interactions, implications on the Pan-Arctic glacier mass budget. Um, this is relevant to, to the overall goal of IASC of uh, the role of the Arctic in the global system. Um, and so I'm going to talk a bit about the activities um, linked to that um, later on. Um, we can see there's kind of several different activities that we have proposed because um, we're kind of building these foci around a, a broad five-year plan um, to try and make sure that we, we kind of tackle some of the main um, parts of this foci and that we kind of achieve tangible um, results um, from our working group funding initiatives. Um, so an example in this case would be, you know, generally trying to foster development of glacier ocean models um, and contributing to things like into comparison projects um, around um, place your mass balance. So the second theme we have is actually a kind of new one um, which was proposed at the last meeting we had which is extreme cryospheric events um, and so the broad idea is to try and understand the impact of changing the changing frequency and intensity of cryospheric extremes um, across kind of all different elements of, of um, Arctic science really. Um, so this is really a, a strong cross-cutting um, foci. Um, so things like snowfall, icing, avalanches, glacier floods, um, thawing permafrost, um, sea ice dynamics too. Um, so we're hoping this can kind of tap into some of the different themes of all of the, the different working groups. Again, this is a new theme. Um, but it's something that we're still kind of hashing out how, how to, to go about tackling this over the next few years. Um, so this is where getting input from the, from the US community could also be useful. And then there's a third um, foci or theme is this cutting barriers in snow knowledge, which again has been one that's been um, kind of part of the Quarisphere working group for a few years now. Um, but the main idea is to establish an improved common knowledge on snow related processes by linking snow interested specialists across the field, I should say. Um, and so the main way that's been carried out in the past has been this, these winter schools on um, um, snow science, which again I'll, I'll mention in the activity. Um, but we're trying to think of ways of it, uh, branching out and expanding this 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 foci. So um, trying to think of different snow scientists across different disciplines. Um, there's been a general kind of sense of this being more aligned to, to alpine um, snow scientists, um, terrestrial snow scientists, but we're keen to kind of expand this to say snow on sea ice or, or fern even. Um, and there's kind of different ideas we have for that. But again, um, we're trying to think of, of the best ways of doing that. Um, so just to go through some of the activities, so the, the previously funded activities are listed here. Um, again, these are the, the primary funding activities. It also contributed to some of the cross-cutting um, activities that have been listed before, so things like um, the, the permafrost cartoon series. Um, but um, yeah, we had we had a few um, links to that glacier ocean interaction theme we had, so observing and modeling meltwater retention processes in snow and fern on ice sheets and glaciers. Um, that was in Denmark um, 2016. Um, we had a workshop on carving of um, the yeah, importance of carving to the mass balance of Arctic glaciers um, in Poland. And then finally one this year on understanding the atmosphere glacier ocean interactions, um, which was held in, in Maine in the US um, this January. Um, and then that, that snow studies winter school um, we had, um, I think that should be February. Of 2017, actually in Finland. Um, but looking ahead, some of these are carrying on, and some of these are new activities. Um, so, so the first one listed here is, is kind of part of this general IASC um, network of Arctic glaciologists, um, and it's kind of a continuation of some of these workshops, um, some of the workshop series they've been um, hosting. So this one's again on Arctic glaciology, but also adding in um, elements of um, marine ecosystems that were mentioned in the previous 
um, presentations by the marine working group. So um, there's two sessions in that um, workshop. So one on understanding atmosphere glacier ocean interactions and the implications for the pan Arctic glacier mass budget. And the second session will be around the importance of Arctic glaciers for the Arctic marine ecosystem. And again, I think the um, the deadline for that is coming up, so we'll be posting on the um, IARPIC website for more information. Um, another one of interest to me, especially, is because it's one that I'm leading, is, is um, the focus group for the upcoming Polar 2018 um, workshop. Um, this is in, on improving our understanding of extreme events in the Arctic using the cross disciplinary approach. So the idea here is we're going to have a small, maybe 12 to 15 people focus group um, spanning multiple days of this meeting where we're going to try and kind of hash out better that scientific um, theme that we, we've um, generated and try and understand how different parts of the um, uh, how different parts of I ask and some of the different working groups can come together to, to better understand extreme events and how they're all maybe interconnected or, or maybe in some cases not um, using some kind of different case studies that we, we feel might be of interest. Um, and then another new workshop is Knowledge Gaps of Cryospheric Extremes, again linked to that new theme, um, which Yari Hapala is leading. So that will be somewhere in Finland next year. And again, when we get information about that, we'll be posting that to the IRP website. Uh, and then there's going to be a continuation of this Snow Studies Winter School. Um, the details are still to be decided. I think that's all I have. Hi, I'm uh, Manisha Ganeshan, and uh, as it has already been mentioned, I'm a fellow to the Atmospheric Working Group of IAS, and I'm also an early career researcher at NASA Goddard. Um, I'll start by introducing the steering group. Uh, we have an international steering group as well. Uh, the chair is Thomas Spengler, who's from Norway. And then we have three vice chairs. Uh, one of them is uh, the US delegate to IAS, John Cassano. Uh, this, earlier this year, in the um, ASSW meeting in Prague, the scientific foci was redefined for our group, and uh, they include now clouds, water vapor, aerosols, fluxes, Arctic air pollution, coupled Arctic climate system, Arctic weather extremes, and the linkages between Arctic and the rest of the globe, and um, it's Arctic's role in the global climate system. Uh, and I mean, the, the reason for doing this must have uh, been many, but one of them was to kind of uh, include more cross-cutting science in our foresight. So for instance, uh, the emphasis on coupled, studying the coupled Arctic climate system uh, is also because there's an interest for the uh, group to improve sea ice prediction and improve models um, through a better processes, understanding of the fluxes and uh, exchange of the sea ice and ocean atmosphere interface. So um, there's also a lot of emphasis on understanding air pollution in the Arctic and not just its impact in a local uh, context, but also in a global uh, context, as well as its uh, impact on the uh, health and well-being of Arctic communities and ecosystems, as well as, for example, looking at life cycle of atmospheric pollutants through the atmosphere and the, uh, the terrestrial and marine ecosystems as well. So there is a lot of uh, emphasis now on becoming more interdisciplinary. Um, and earlier this year, we were asked to come up with a strategic plan for our group. And uh, it was decided that we have uh, three pillars around which our forthcoming activities will uh, revolve. For instance, uh, you, many of you might have already heard of Mosaic, and uh, there is a heavy participation from IRPIC on uh, this one. So I won't talk much about it, except that I mentioned that it was uh, originally born out of IAS. So it is the uh, first sponsor of Mosaic, though now it's a very large international effort. Um, there's also PACES, which is Air Pollution in the Arctic Climate, Environment, and Societies. And this was originally born out of the International Global um, Atmospheric Chemistry Project, but uh, IASC is a co-sponsor. And um, there have been many workshops in the past from this uh, PACES uh, group, but there's also some forthcoming uh, workshops that I'll be talking about. And there's YOP, or the Polar Prediction Project, which is uh, WMO's effort to uh, observe and uh, improve the operational forecasting for polar regions. And uh, though IASC is directly involved in the operation for logistics, uh, the uh, AWG group this year, uh, earlier this year initiated an internal task force to engage with the uh, PPP and YOPD 
science and to kind of uh, encourage cross collaborations between IASC and BioPP. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So for um, Mosaic, there's an upcoming implementation workshop later on this month in St. Petersburg, and uh, the agenda has been posted on the IASC website. Um, there's also going to be a science conference sometime early next year. Um, and then the field operations are scheduled to begin, as you might know, from 2019 to 2020. Uh, there will be an implementation workshop prior to the field operations and the science conference at the end. So there will be posts about these coming up soon on the Arctic website as uh, the date nears. Uh, there's a PACES implementation plan as well that is scheduled for later this month and an AGU session. So um, I'll try to find out more about these and post on the Arabic website as and when I get information. Uh, there's going to be a local Arctic air pollution workshop next year. And uh, there's some talk for potential ground-based campaign in 2019-2020, as well as a large-scale aircraft measurement campaign called IMPACT for 2020-2021. Um, the information that I have for these campaigns are quite limited, but I'll uh, you know encourage anyone from the I ask an AWG group to post about it as they come across more information. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about YOP. As I said, uh, we start, initiated an internal working group in AWG to engage more with YOP. And uh, the idea is to basically um, guide the scientific principles because YOP is doing a lot of um, science that I ask is interested <coughs> in. So uh, there are some indoor science projects. Um, and scientists working towards answering specific research questions, and uh, that might actually be an overlap with our scientific foresight. So uh, the goal is to engage the U.S. community and all um, all the indoor science projects from York to um, attend a, a future IAS sponsored workshop that will probably be held next fall, and there'll be one conference at the end of the polar prediction period as well. So I will be posting more about that as I get more information, but for the time being, if any of you are in, engaged in um, your indoor science projects, I would encourage you to please talk to me or anybody else from the AWG to get more information. Um, I think that's all I have, but I just want to add as a IAS fellow that uh, the Atmospheric Working Group had a very limited number of uh, applications. So um, the idea, the the sense we got was that because the atmosphere, uh, sci atmospheric science is not uh, limited to polar science, for instance, um, cloud and radiation sci scientists don't think of them as polar scientists. So we want to uh, emphasize that um, you can encourage postdocs and students to apply, even though their focus is not specifically polar. It could be cloud scientists. And for instance, I didn't have a background in polar studies when I was doing my PhD, but I uh, was fortunate to get a project in my postdoc, and um, I'm happy that I applied to the fellowship because it's been a very, very enriching experience. So, yeah. Thanks, Manisha, and all of the presenters. I'm just going to run the camera. Anybody on the call? So, we'll add one. One other thing about, uh, about our IAS fellows, we've, uh, the IAS fellows just across the board have been wonderful for the last several years. It's, they've been incredible. We, we had a lot of great applicants and we pick out her people to be that. We've been really, really fortunate and uh, the U.S. has been particularly lucky. They've been a great group. They've been really engaged. And so I think uh, I'm really pleased with the, uh, the way they participate in all our events. And, uh, we look forward to continued collaborations. The other thing I just want to add is that you can see the way we have through this. There's a tremendous amount of activities that are that are ongoing, that are being coordinated by IASC, and there's a, a huge number of international opportunities for for collaboration. So please do uh, do participate in these events and uh, these activities. It's, uh, it makes the science better. It makes the uh, outcomes better, and it uh, will en enhance your own career. So please please join us on these efforts. So at this point, I'd like to uh, thank all the presenters and, and open up for questions. And if there are further questions, okay. 
Okay, great. So if there are. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Give me <any> Larry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's turn on the echo to go with the screen. <laughs> so. And you can ask questions in the chat box or yeah. or <laughs> it gives you angle that yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. Dan. Get, get in chat box or you can unmute yourself. Yeah, one in the audience. Martin? Larry, could I just follow up on uh, what Anisha just said? A final comment that um, you know, we in the polar research community, or more particularly the Arctic research community, it's reference here. We don't have all the talent and all the answers, and we can we have a lot to learn from bringing in outside expertise. They can't hear you. No, you're going to have to speak oh, yeah. up. Uh, you want to hear? Yep. Sorry, I'll start again. Um, I'd like to follow up on uh, Manisha's final comment um, about her own background originally not being a polar atmospheric scientist. And, and I think in, in the Arctic science community, and this applies to the Antarctic science community, we don't have all the talent and all the answers. And there's a lot we can learn from bringing in outside expertise and converting them into polar science. Who will stay in the polar science community and add to it and enhance it? So thanks for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, that's a, that's a good point, Martin. One of the reasons we started the IASC Fellow Program in the first place was because we wanted to identify, you know, the top tier of the young, young researchers and, and keep them engaged in, uh, in Arctic science. And actually, I really like the way Alec has, uh, has been defining himself as, as an ex early career scientist. I'm going to start doing that too. <laughs> <laughs> Trying, trying. <laughs> sure. Are there other uh, comments? Or? One more technical thing. I had to mute a few of you who were on the uh, telephone. So I'm going to unmute you now. Um, so if you're screaming at us trying to ask a question, that may be why. <laughs> you can also raise your hand if you have a question. So this is Simon. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, so uh, you've just gone through a lot of uh, great information really quickly. I think because this is an IAS, uh, sorry, an IOPIC webinar, uh, we've we've captured all of that information. Um, but uh, so that's that's good. Um, but is it also available on the website? I I think I just went to the website and there's. There's a very nice overview of each of the working groups, but it doesn't. If, uh, if unless I've not dug into it enough, it doesn't go into that amount of detail. And I think it really would be good to have uh, somewhere captured the the, uh, the extent of the activities that have gone on under each of the working groups. Thanks, Simon. So um, we've also posted. So we we are using the Arabic collaborative teams as a mechanism for outreach for the IASC working groups. And so there are information posts there that, that are available. Um, but we we will take that to heart as far as I think um, Matt Druckenmiller and I were just speaking earlier that we really need to have more information about the various activities on the IASC webpage. And we'll try and, and get um, better information there so that people can track this information down and can follow it up. So that, that's a good suggestion. Simon, I don't know if you can open the chat box, but on the chat box, I did put a link. Each of the speakers has posted an update about their um, working group. So there is a current post from each of the speakers um, that just spoke about something related, as some of them are a summary of what they just gave now as well. Okay, great. Sarah, yeah. Sarah Matt, Matt and I also posted some materials. Can you send out that link too, please? Yes. And we'll. Each of the briefs, the PowerPoint decks, be posted to the IOPIC website as well. We certainly can if we haven't already. Are they there? With your permission. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> uh, question just came in from Betsy. Yes, this webinar will be, um, it has, has been recorded and it'll be available on the Arabic website soon. 
I think we've sent out an announcement over Arctic Info too, to just make sure that we're getting it out to uh, the, the entire community. So I will restate one thing I said earlier to the, to the community and that we are your voice to the international community. And so if there is an activity that you want to promote, you, if there's something that you think fits well with the, uh, the IOSC working groups, please let us know and, and uh, let us take that information for you to the international community. And again, please try and uh, engage in many of these activities. A great way to let them know about your activities is by posting on the IRFIC website. Another good thing to do is to post an event. So some of you talked about an upcoming meeting. If you put it on the event page and give a little description about it, a lot of people just check out that event page to see what's coming up. And so that's another way to just flag it for people. I would just add to what Larry said that it's it's a two-way street that you can take advantage of IOPIC's capabilities, the platform, to communicate back to the United States polar science community what's going on at IASC, what you particularly have been representing on part of the US community. As, and, and that hopefully could encourage more US scientists to get involved in IASC in the work through the working groups and the projects and so on. So the, uh, the US delegates are just the US representatives to these working groups, but these working groups meet at the annual Arctic Science Summit Weeks. And it's at these Arctic Science Summit Weeks, that's where much of these activities occur. And so I do encourage US researchers to participate in those. The next one is gonna be in Davos in June of next year, and it's gonna be a joint meeting with SCAR, and I think it's gonna be the program for the uh, Davos meeting looks terrific. It, it is posted now, there's a lot of good sessions it's, a, it's going to be a huge meeting and I think it's going to go for almost two weeks as far as there's so many side events going on and uh, so it's, it's going to be a, a, a great event and uh, we're looking forward to it. We're also at that event we're also hosting the next the fourth Arctic Observing Summit which will be towards the end of the uh, towards the end of the uh, joint meeting. Uh, I see that Renee Tatesco raised her hand. Did you have a question Renee? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, to, uh, for Andre, uh, the Human and Social Working Group. Andre, are you familiar with the Social and Economic Research and Applications Subcommittee under the Polar Prediction Project of the World Meteorological Organization by any chance? No, i personally not familiar with that. Okay, I'm happy to follow up with you um, uh, afterwards. Um, and then also to Alec uh, regarding the cryosphere working group. Um, are you familiar with the WMO Global Cryosphere Watch? Yes, so I'll, I'll, I'll jump in for that. So yes, actually we've, uh, that's, that's been a real strong partner for SEON and uh, we've had lots of good interactions with that group. So um, we have, uh, and with GEO also, so, uh, We've, uh, SEON is working with them, establishing agreements and, and trying to, to work together to get uh, common protocols for sharing data. And, and uh, we, we, we have a very common agenda. So I think there's, uh, there's plenty of opportunities for collaboration there. Great, and then just one final question um, for uh, perhaps the Atmosphere Working Group and the Marine uh, Working Group. Is there any, discussion within the working group about a research to operations emphasis? I, I think uh, this is Lee Cooper. I, I think that we all recognize the, um, the need to do that to transition uh, to operational um, uh, sorts of uh, uh, mechanisms for uh, uh, observing and uh, monitoring uh, the, uh, the environment, but I, it, it may be a little bit out of the scope of, of what we normally talk about. But I think, uh, you know, it depends on which, which activity we're talking about. You know, I think the year of polar prediction, I think that's, that really is, you know, almost centered around with this, the high objective of taking that to operational use. So, you know, it, it depends. 
I think somebody, maybe it was you, Larry, you mentioned there's an IASC action team on research to policy makers and decision makers. That's heading in that direction of research to operations. Right, actually, so that's, that's another good example. So, um, so Gosha is leading an effort to, uh, to improve our connectivity with policymakers. But we have another action group too, which is really focused on, on business and industry, in that what we want to try and do is better understand what, as, as the business activities, industrial activities are increasing in the Arctic, they have many research needs, and we're trying to understand what those needs are so we can better get ahead of them and, and address those needs to make sure that operations do occur efficiently and effectively and safely. And we're also trying to uh, engage industry better in the scientific activities so we can hopefully get you know, more, in, more support from their efforts so they can, uh, much of the, the observations activities that are occurring in the Arctic are being underwritten by industry, but that data is not being shared broadly. And so we wanna try and help, help them accomplish that, help them make uh, science better. You know, and I, this is Renee again. I just also want to point out that y'all are conducting some excellent research, but it doesn't do anybody any good, including those policymakers, if that if those research capabilities, those methodologies, those tools aren't made available in an operational framework. So I would certainly encourage all of you to consider, um, you know, uh, operational agencies like the U.S. Geological Survey, the the National Weather Service, um, NASA. Um, and 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 work with them directly to ensure that your excellent research um, um, is is taken into consideration and and possibly is included in the operational um, um, underpinning of, of our of our agencies. Thank you. Thanks, Renee. It, it actually it, it's, it's it's that is uh, we have another program called ADAC Arctic Main Awareness Center. And, it's, and that is the focus as far as it's trying to get uh, the science translated into the operations. And that's a huge hurdle, actually. It's, uh, it's not always so easy to get the, the agencies to, uh, to uh, engage scientific findings, and it's not easy to, uh, to make those scientific findings directly applicable for the agencies. So, I mean, it's a, that, that's a, we probably need another uh, action group just to, just to focus on how to accomplish that. It looks like Bob is using the hand raise. Bob, do you have a question? Yeah, so um, Larry, can you say uh, the uh, action teams that you mentioned, um, uh, the ones about communicating with uh, policymakers and uh, with industry and so forth, um, are there opportunities for the broader community to get involved in those uh, beyond the people who are already sort of I ask insiders? Absolutely, so the, uh, so the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not so engaged in the, uh, the policy one, so I don't know how, how I can speak about that as far as what they're doing. They are, I guess I can say a little bit, they are creating a, uh, a, a strategic plan now and they are moving forward. I don't know what the uh, short-term efforts are going to be as far as how they can engage people, but I, I know that Gosha would want to do that. As far as the, the business and industry plan, so we did just host an, an open session at the uh, Arctic Science, Arctic Circle Assembly in Reykjavik just a few weeks ago. And that was, uh, we had a great discussion on, uh, we had participants there as far as, um, there were scientists who, who have uh, created, or have new ideas as far as that uh, want to be, or that are ready to be uh, marshaled into licenses and into uh, products, and they need business partners to do that. So that was one aspect where they're certainly welcome uh, broader activities. And the other one was from, uh, we had participants from the, the oil industry and from the mining industry and about how to, uh, what their needs are. And so they were talking about the, what the needs are, what the, how the research should be directed. And so there's, uh, there's plenty of efforts there, plenty of opportunities there to engage with industry as far as moving forward. But also, I think we would certainly welcome further involvement from industry on what their needs are so we can hopefully tune the science to, to, to address those needs. So um, we probably will, well actually, yeah, we, we intend to, the uh, Arctic Observing Summit is gonna be heavily be focused on the value tree analysis for what science needs and then um, what business and industry 
what their needs are. And so that uh, in Davos, we will address that very, very heavily. And so there's plenty of opportunities to engage there, particularly through those sessions. So I encourage all of the community to, uh, to participate in those. Any more questions? Any further comments from any of our working group delegates? So, so I guess I'll take this point to, uh, from on behalf of the IASC and all our working group members, I'll thank everybody for uh, your attention and interest and engagement. And, and I ask you to, to please uh, come back to us if there's uh, if you have further ideas or further comments or suggestions on on how we can better serve the uh, U.S. Arctic research community, or if there's uh, ideas that you have that you want us to take to the international community, please don't hesitate to uh, to contact me or any of our members. So thank you very much.